Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, the introduction. Thanks for inviting me to uh, speak with you uh, this morning. It's great to see so many of you here and um, I'm sure you're deeply embedded in this uh, topic for this morning, uh, which I've titled The Era of Intelligence. We are in fact well into the era of intelligence. The fourth uh, industrial revolution certainly moving on towards uh, what many name as the fifth industrial revolution. So I want to explore uh, that topic um, a bit today. Um, I want to talk uh, just a little bit about AI and machine learning and, uh, and some worldwide trends that I've garnered from uh, my experience uh, this year. Uh, the context of higher education and, and the environment we find ourselves in. Um, use of AI and machine learning and, and analytics uh, probably uh, not too far into the IA, uh, AI space in most universities, but certainly deep into the machine learning and, and analytics space. Uh, and some predictions on how that might revolutionise uh, teaching and learning as we go forward and then how do we actually make sure in the midst of all of this we're equipping our graduates uh, for the future. Uh, so uh, just to start off, um, artificial intelligence, as I'm, I'm sure you're all aware, is not a new topic at all. Uh, it's something that has actually been around uh, for a very long time, way back in the, the 1950s. Uh, you know, a technique enabling computers to mimic human behaviour. Uh, there's been a lot of researchers and a lot of practical applications of AI for uh, a very long time. But we do see the acceleration of that space now uh, in the higher education sector, certainly starting to take off, in many other sectors starting to become uh, very well uh, embedded. Machine learning, uh, a technique uh, that gives computers the ability to uh, learn and, and uh, demonstrate uh, that learning without explicitly programming it to do so. So we've got lots of applications of, of machine learning uh, in our environments. And then deep learning and that neural pathways and uh, you know, a subset of machine learning uh, but actually sort of making computation of, of multi-layer neural networks uh, a real uh, possibility and really, really feasible. Uh, so artificial intelligence well and truly uh, with us. We often talk about how fast technology is changing and it certainly, it certainly is. But these are not new concepts uh, for us at all. It is all about the data and, and as was just suggested, politicians and others are starting to really understand now that data uh, is really important and there's lots of different forms of data. You've got data at, at rest, uh, terabytes and, and exabytes of existing data to process. We've got data in, in motion uh, and velocity. We've got a variety of data, data in its many, many forms, structured, unstructured, uh, text, multimedia data. Our data comes from a variety of sources. And then data in doubt. There's a lot of uncertainty due to inconsistencies and, and incompleteness and ambiguities in the data. Uh, so volume, velocity, variety and veracity are really the various forms of, of data. And in our organisations, in universities and organisations of higher education uh, and, and post-secondary education, certainly many, many forms of data uh, that we can uh, use and we have available to us. But the important thing about the data is not just collecting it, but actually moving uh, that data into action. I think in universities we work a lot with industry and with other organisations with helping to upskill a variety of, of people in their places of employment about how to use the data, about the data science, the application uh, of the data. I'm not so sure we're as good within our own institutions as upskilling all of our staff in the use of that data. Uh, because that, without putting the data into action, uh, it's really uh, not necessarily that useful. So various forms of action. We've got descriptive analytics and describing actually what happened. Uh, diagnostic analytics um, and really examining why did, why did it happen. Predictive analytics, what, what's going to happen next? And I think many of us use all these uh, forms of data in action. And then prescriptive analytics, what should I do either from a strategic perspective in decision making 
or from an operational uh, perspective in terms of decisions about automation and, and what we actually do with the data. So there's a lot of opportunities for us, I think, within our organisations to uh, really make sure that the data that's being collected uh, is put into the hands of those who can uh, best use it, who can put it into to action and importantly, put it into action for the benefit of our uh, students uh, who are our clients. If you um, look at uh, what's happening uh, around the world, I'm uh, on the UNESCO National Commission for Australia as the education representative. And as part of, of that role, I do have the opportunity uh, to spend quite a lot of time at UNESCO, either at the Paris headquarters or, or at um, on various uh, UNESCO uh, conferences and, and uh, workshops. I had the opportunity earlier this year to uh, go to Beijing and there was a week-long uh, conference there hosted by the People's Republic of China and UNESCO. UNESCO has some 194 uh, member countries and about 164 of them was represented at the conference. What I, I guess I was surprised at in that uh, conference uh, was uh, the presentations from uh, a variety of education ministers and ministers of IT and cybersecurity from around the world, uh, all talking about their strategies in this space of, of AI. So it's one thing to know that artificial intelligence has been around for a while, that we've got data, we need to know how to use it. But it is important at all levels of society, from government all the way through organisations and, and into uh, the parts of our organisations to have a really good strategy about uh, what are we doing in this space of AI, machine learning, automation. Uh, you can see there, um, you know, the Canadians have, have had an AI strategy since 2017. Uh, other countries have uh, developed uh, their, their strategies, uh, Sweden and others into 2018. Uh, you'll see uh, Australia down here. Uh, we uh, first mentioned sort of AI from uh, the perspective of this in our budget, uh, but we haven't got a, a national uh, strategy that's being uh, espoused across organisations and across the country as the way we're going to move forward. Um, many countries are really sort of well advanced in, in this space and certainly moving on to next generation AI plans. But I think the breadth of countries involved in AI and having country plans, I thought, was quite impressive. Uh, the conference uh, very much uh, hosted by China, um, and China is working into several, uh, in fact, many of the developing countries, and working in partnership with many of these countries as well in the development of AI and the progression of their strategy as well. Um, because the UK and the US have left the UNESCO space uh, largely wide open, China is certainly filling that, that void and investing heavily uh, in some countries and even in the developing countries where there isn't necessarily a lot of uh, funds available for investment. They are making investment into AI and machine learning because many see this as the opportunity for equity and access in education. Uh, so I think a lot happening in that front. In Australia, we've been working, uh, our government's been working on the ethical framework around AI. They've also been working around uh, global alliances and uh, equivalents of qualifications across jurisdictions and so forth, which involves uh, AI and, and uh, some uh, active um, you know, machine learning. Uh, but I think a strategy is, is really uh, something we're looking for. And, and I guess I pose the question, does your university, does your organisation have an AI strategy or does AI form part of your uh, roadmap for IT in your universities or organisations? Uh, I'd have to say at Curtin, uh, we're doing a bit in this space, but not really an overarching uh, strategy as such. Um, when you look uh, also at what's happening in, in countries specifically, I've just drawn out a few examples here. Uh, this was presented by the Minister of Education of Japan. So you can see some of these strategies are quite well formed. Very big investment. Uh, they're working uh, towards the Olympics 
and have actually put in place a lot of AI strategies in the planning uh, for the uh, Olympics, the use of, of sensors across the city, et cetera, for safety and security. They're certainly working uh, in the uh, real world space there uh, around agriculture and, and health and uh, resilience. Uh, a big investment in research and development, uh, digitalization at the government level and certainly focused on education and uh, human resource development as well. Um, across the EU, um, for a couple of years now, uh, they've actually had a, a broad strategy bringing together uh, member states, uh, really focused on the uptake of AI and tackling that socioeconomic change. So again, a big focus on the use of AI uh, for equity and access uh, to education and ensuring that there is that ethical and legal uh, framework in place. Uh, and then countries like Russia, uh, probably not surprising, they, they focus very much on their collaboration with other countries. Uh, they've got a national program uh, for the state of uh, the art centres of technology uh, and government programs, etc., working closely in with China. Uh, China has five very, very large research centres which pull research together from across the whole of China and those research centres focus on uh, cognition and neural networks, they focus on biotechnologies, on learning sciences, uh, on uh, uh, implantables and, and some uh, brain uh, AI as well. So some really interesting research and research collaborations uh, between China and, and Russia and, and others. And we see also uh, countries like Egypt having a large national strategy they see that AI will contribute um, about 7.7% of gross domestic product. That's about $42.5 billion that they're expecting from AI and from the investments they make. So certainly uh, across the United Arab Emirates, um, there's a lot of investment, uh, a lot happening in that space. And you can see the strategies there uh, around uh, guiding research and so forth. Um, when you look at uh, how AI is being adopted, uh, as I said, it varies across countries, it varies across organisations. In the, the US, uh, this is uh, AI at scale and how far along in the US companies are uh, this year. You've got some that are investigating the use of AI, others planning to deploy AI in the organisation, uh, moving up to those already implemented and those planning to have enterprise-wide uh, solutions. Uh, when you look in the US also at who owns AI in the business, it's the whole of the organisation. So outside providers and partnerships, it's delegates uh, to business units, uh, AI as centres of excellence, uh, data analysis areas, uh, business areas, automation, etc. So the whole of the business uh, gets involved in this and I think for us in in universities and as education providers, as AI develops, it will become a whole of business and enterprise-wide uh, uh, endeavour. Uh, and when you look at building the AI-ready workforce, which I think is you know, very much necessary, it will be very much needed, uh, it'll be a big focus. Uh, building this workforce, you can see that some haven't thought about it yet, some are putting the pipeline, talent pipeline in place others uh, putting it into workforce planning and others implementing continual learning. And I know in our work with uh, companies, particularly in Western Australia in the mining industry and so forth, where there already is uh, a lot of AI and automation uh, in many of, of the companies, they're looking very much to upskill their workforce. The sorts of education they're requiring is more education for their employees around cyber security, around blockchain, around data science, uh, around machine learning, uh, around uh, automation, uh, etc. So really upskilling the workforce of the future is a, a very big part of uh, what I think we'll all be involved in uh, going forward. Uh, when you look at some of the AI considerations, there's um, uh, AI for use like uh, fat shaming of, of cats on wheels, which might not be very useful at all. Uh, there's really good uses of AI, and AI has been shown to be able to identify rare genetic conditions or 
using in fighting fires and, and predicting uh, where fires might happen. It's used uh, often uh, in the UK around predicting where crimes might happen and, and the police departments and so forth getting involved. But we know that AI uh, can also be used, uh, I guess, for evil as well as for good. Um, it can also uh, make mistakes and we've still got a way to go uh, to really uh, finalise um, and I guess make sure that when we use AI that it can uh, be totally uh, trusted. A couple of examples here where I.B. Watson actually gave the incorrect uh, treatment. Another one down here where AI uh, was scrapped because it was sexist. So as we develop AI, we have to be very careful uh, and mindful of the ethical framework that we work within, but also that as we develop AI, we have to take into consideration that AI will have the bias of the developers. So we have to take account for gender, for sexuality, for ethnicity, for equality. Uh, there are many factors to be considered uh, as we go down this path and as we uh, develop AI. The ethical framework, this um, I've borrowed from uh, the one presented at the, the conference earlier in the year, and it's from the, uh, the EU, but very similar to uh, many of the ethical frameworks uh, that are in play. And I think everyone here would agree that uh, we need AI to be trustworthy as we uh, move forward. We need to make sure that there's agency oversight, that there's human oversight as we develop AI and that as we implement AI, uh, technical robustness and, and safety, obviously uh, security, cyber security and the like really um, coming to the fore in I think all of our organisations and certainly as we embark further on, on the AI journey. Uh, privacy and data governance, uh, being transparent about what we're using AI for and how it's being implemented. Uh, the well-being of society and the environment very much as a, a focus as we implement uh, various initiatives with uh, machine learning, AI, etc. And diversity and non-discrimination, and that really is dependent on the developers and that we take the various uh, uh, minority and other groups into consideration as AI is being developed um, and that we have accountability uh, in the implementation of AI as well. So I think the implementation of ethical frameworks, I think we'd all agree, uh, needs to happen alongside of anything that we're uh, doing in this space. If you uh, look at the era of uh, intelligence, uh, and as I said, we're, we're certainly uh, already well on this uh, journey. Um, and if we look back in history, history's got quite a bit to teach us about this transition that we find ourselves in. In the first industrial revolution around the 1760s, lasted till about 1820, 1840, uh, steam and the invention of the steam engine and having steam uh, powered factories uh, was what happened at, at that time. And what you found at that time was that there was a lot of unrest, there was a lot of uh, riots, factory workers and others trying to implement change and bring uh, steam power to the factories uh, and make that change. But a, a lot of uh, resistance from others around that. And I think if you look at our current situation, we're also at a time of unrest. I don't think we're having riots in the street about uh, what's happening in, with AI and automation uh, at the moment, but we certainly are seeing political unrest, and you can see this in various countries, whether that's the UK or the US, uh, some uh, debate within our own country. Uh, but certainly, um, you know, uh, real change as we're seeing this rise of automation and robots, and I think a lot of debate uh, and a lot of uh, disquiet. And I think as we talk about uh, robots coming in and, and changing some of the jobs, uh, there's a level of unease even at an individual uh, level. We also see quite a bit of divergence uh, with AI coming into play. So um, while uh, in some parts of the country, AI and that automation is, is very much welcomed and actually streamlines business and Im improves productivity, uh, in other parts of the country, 
In the US, you look at places like Chicago and Detroit, the manufacturing industry is, is going down, whereas other areas of the country, like Silicon Valley, have got computer software programmers, uh, computer engineers, uh, AI developers, etc., are uh, really coming into their own. So you get real uh, divergence in what happens to an economy as AI is, is implemented. And I guess something we need to be mindful of uh, as uh, more automation and, and the use of AI comes into our society, how do we prepare people? How do we assist them from an education perspective? Uh, what's that going to mean to our economy in different parts of the, the country? Uh, and a significant change, as we know, from low skills to, to high skills. Um, there's a professor in the UK, uh, Carl Benedict Frey. He talks a lot about data being the new oil in the age of intelligence. And uh, he talks also about the changes that will happen in education, that we need to look for more modular approaches to our education, that maybe the three or four year degree uh, isn't what is going to be needed going forward, that we're going to perhaps need to uh, help students move through uh, content and curriculum, but in a different way that's perhaps not limited by time and is much more flexible with moving in and out of the workforce. Uh, and he also talks a lot about our need to teach differently, that creativity as we know isn't something that can be easily uh, copied uh, by AI and that that needs to come much more into our teaching and that if we focus as universities on continuing to encourage our students to write, to debate and to discuss, that, that really is a differentiator uh, for humans uh, from AI and anything that uh, might come and uh, replace us. Uh, in this age of intelligence, what's happening in higher education? Uh, well, uh, quite a lot. Um, in the era of uh, higher education as, as we find ourselves, it really is uh, a uh, data-driven uh, era. We really need to use the data to make decisions in our universities, whether it's at that strategic or operational uh, level. Uh, really using the data to transform 21st century learning um, as we know, students have got unprecedented choice in where they study and how they study uh, these days. And it's up to us to provide those flexible options. Uh, and indeed, um, many of us have already uh, moved in that uh, direction. Whether we're providing uh, enough uh, for what will be required in the future, um, I'm not too sure. Um, students really, as they're coming through now and those that are are uh, going to enter university in the next five or ten years will have very different expectations about flexibility and, and us providing exactly what they want when they want it rather than uh, fitting into schedules that we uh, currently have. Um, Education is very much a global business. Um, we're competing in the university sector not with other sec uh, universities in our state or even across the nation. We're competing uh, a lot with private providers and with other universities and private uh, higher education providers across uh, other countries. And as we know, um, many, many corporates are moving into the education space and they're very agile, they're very good at what they do, uh, they provide some good offerings. So we need to really focus on what it is uh, we as universities uh, will offer into the future to be competitive. It's very much a global business. And we know that employers are wanting something different from students when they graduate. They want to uh, make sure students have got those uh, soft skills or transferable skills. Uh, as, as these graduates will move through many jobs during their uh, career, uh, not five or 10, but predicted uh, that people change jobs now every uh, two and a half years. So lots and lots of jobs across perhaps different industries and we have to prepare our students uh, for that. Uh, so at Curtin we certainly believe that our, our future is global. Uh, we keep a close eye on things like um, are our degrees relevant anymore? What sort of offerings are students looking for? And I think many of those questions are 
are at the forefront of, of all your minds as well in your organisations uh, too. Uh, when you look at, at this uh, uh, map, what it shows is that uh, internet use by time zone, um, where we live in Western Australia and not too far from, from here either, there's more than a billion uh, internet users just one hour either side of our time zone. So synchronous learning is really uh, very viable and across uh, countries with very uh, large uh, populations as well. Uh, so if you were ever in doubt that uh, we're completing globally, um, I think you, know, you only have to look at what's happening around the world uh, uh, to be informed. Um, as we're looking at artificial intelligence in higher education, uh, we know, um, and this is from the Horizon report, that there's many difficult and uh, wicked problems and uh, the thought that AI can help us with these is very much at the forefront. And the Horizon report, I'm sure many of you have, have read it, uh, but they talk about the adoption of adaptive learning technologies and artificial intelligence being in our institutions in the next couple of years. Now, as I say, many institutions are well on the journey, uh, but I think uh, what we see happening in other countries around the world, whether that's China or India, in Korea, uh, in, in countries like Slovenia, um, in uh, the UAE and other countries, they're already moving to adoption very quickly and I think perhaps much more quickly than we are in Australia. Uh, so not unrealistic that the expectation that we'll have uh, AI amongst us, maybe ro robots in our classroom, uh, is not as far-fetched uh, as it might seem. Um, our classrooms are changing, our, our campuses are changing, and there's no doubt that the new technologies uh, that AI, digital disruption, are really changing education uh, where we live. Um, much more collaborative uh, sort of learning spaces uh, and the use of technology within our classrooms. But always I think we need to be mindful that the technologies are a tool, that pedagogy should always uh, drive the use of, of technology. Uh, but we will need to become more creative, more flexible around our uh, development of curriculum and how we implement that curriculum uh, so that students truly can access uh, teaching and learning at any time on any device anywhere in the world uh, and flexibly uh, in a way that they're uh, looking for. The sorts of technologies that I think we're all seeing in our environments, uh, certainly technologies that are changing the physical uh, world, many of you uh, have these already within your institutions. At Curtin, we're doing a lot around the Internet of Things. Uh, we've developed a MicroMasters with edX uh, on the Internet of Things. And, and interestingly, uh, a company in India, Tech Mahindra, has now said that anyone who studies our MicroMasters on the Internet of Things can actually have uh, an interview for employment at their company. So they're bypassing the degree and focusing on what do we do in the short courses, and in this case, uh, around the Internet of Things. But robotics, biotechnology, 3D printing, uh, use of maker spaces in different ways so that all of this technology can be used. Um, certainly at our institution, uh, we're working in this way. And then technologies that are changing uh, the digital world, whether that be AI or machine learning, or uh, computation uh, research centres, uh, which are being developed uh, uh, across the country. So at Curtin, we've got an institute of computation, has five different streams across biotechnology, across learning sciences, engineering, uh, AI, etc. And from that, uh, we've developed a partnership with Optus, and Optus has co-funded uh, a chair in artificial intelligence working with us. So. There's no doubt, and I'm sure in your organisations as well, that these uh, technologies uh, which are changing the world are, are already starting uh, to impact uh, where we work. Uh, a bit of light relief. I guess a lot of people think technology is going to ruin us. Uh, uh, they think it is making us antisocial, that perhaps it's not what we should be doing or where we should be going. But if you look at this, perhaps we were always a bit antisocial in, in some places. People have just replaced their newspaper with their mobile phone uh, while we sit on public transport and, and uh, ignore each other. 
Um, but technology is no doubt having uh, uh, an impact uh, and there's, there's, I guess, no doubt about that. But at the same time, you know, generations of students are changing and students are being uh, exposed to technology uh, very uh, early on. I have a daughter who teaches pre-primary and she has a lot of technology in the classroom. I'm sure many of you have got children who go into pre-primary and they, uh, they work on the touch screen, they use automation. Uh, in many countries around the world, they're bringing AI into uh, uh, their classrooms and into the world at a very early age. And even in countries like Bulgaria and others, which don't have a, a lot of um, uh, resources available to them. Uh, and employers are also changing their expectations uh, as well. Uh, so we know that employers uh, are expecting different things from, from graduates. Uh, workers are going to spend 100% of their time on critical thinking and problem solving and much more time learning on the job. And if that's the future, what are we as institutions doing about recognising that learning on the job as credit into our courses rather than duplication and, and reteaching? So workers are going to need to be entrepreneurial and have that sort of mindset uh, as they work in various areas of the organisation. So what is the future of work? I think sometimes people uh, talk quite negatively about the changing jobs and the loss of jobs. Um, and no doubt there will be uh, a declining number of, of uh, jobs. In this uh, report by the World Economic Forum in 2018, prediction of 75 million jobs disappearing uh, by 2022. But we have to also factor in the new jobs that are merging and the new roles that are coming as well. And if you look back across the various industrial revolutions, you'll see that um, while changes have been made, uh, jobs have changed. They haven't necessarily disappeared. We've still got farmers uh, such as we had back at the time of the first industrial revolution. But when you look at what their job was then to, to what their job is now, where they use artificial intelligence on the farm uh, with the cows predicting uh, the, the milk flows and, and so forth, uh, their job is very, very different. Uh, but there still is uh, a job, albeit uh, diminishing uh, numbers required to do those jobs. Um, I'm not sure how many of you saw this uh, report which came out just in the last couple of weeks. Deakin and, and Griffith uh, produced this report in collaboration uh, with Ford Australia. Uh, but it's a great report. I'd recommend it to you. It talks about what are the jobs of the future and uh, the methodology, as I understand it, was to go out and do focus groups uh, with a variety of, of experts in their field and, and ask what are the jobs that are coming forward and I think it's interesting, you know, the cyborg psychologist who's going to help you with your synthetic organs or your implantables or, or your robotic limbs. Uh, I'm sure we'd all need a bit of counselling uh, when that happens. Um, but the commodities uh, broker using machine learning, you know, we know uh, that jobs like financial planning and, and others uh, will be able to be totally automated, have AI in them, you'll be able to be your own financial planner accountants' jobs will change, uh, data privacy strategists, um, uh, changes in medicine around a data-based medical diagnostician whose job is to use the AI and diagnose your, your symptoms, a drone airspace regulator. Um, it was pretty crowded when I flew into Sydney as it was uh, the other night, let alone when we start regulating the airspace for drones. Um, AI energy and data systems installers, uh, freelance virtual clutter organisers. So really different sorts of jobs that are emerging. Um, and I guess the question for all of us is how in our institutions and organisations are we preparing our students and our staff, in fact, for these changes uh, in jobs? Uh, so what are we actually doing at Curtin to prepare for this era of intelligence? Uh, we're on the journey, but I think still a long way to go. Uh, we're trying to scale profitably, uh, to develop personalised learning and data-driven decision-making, uh, and looking at the future workforce and, and digital fluency and, and analytics capabilities within all of our courses. 
connected very much to industry uh, because that's important as we go forward. Uh, and I think partnerships with some of the large organisations who are in fact also delivering education uh, is important. Uh, but certainly it's about uh, being an innovator and having data-driven transformation. So we've got a teaching and learning framework, probably much like that in your institutions, where in all of our courses we try to deliver them in a flipped classroom, face-to-face -face mode that's really interactive. We put some MOOCs and some of our open education resources into our curriculum. Uh, we distribute our learning and, and also uh, we work very much in the online uh, space. So we've developed our learning spaces accordingly, um, changed uh, a lot of our spaces, more than 90 collaborative learning spaces, and a lot of simulation and a lot of collaboration with industry around some of our newer spaces, whether that be our management headquarters or our trading room, so that students get really hands-on, authentic, uh, experience and also working obviously towards authentic assessment in that space. But how we design our learning, our frameworks, how we design our spaces are going to continue to change uh, going forward. And while we have our social media command centre that you see here, uh, we have our, our various simulated spaces and, and changes to our classrooms, I think we all need to think about what are the next generation learning spaces and they probably look a little bit more like the maker spaces that have a variety of uh, materials and technologies for access uh, by our students. And they may well all be learning across the same objectives, but getting to that point in a different way and in a flexible way in their own time and at their own pace, rather than on a schedule, uh, which is the way universities are, are currently run. We distribute our learning uh, across our various campuses. So we've got campuses in Mauritius, Dubai, in Singapore, and in, well, what have I missed? The Perth, Malaysia. Um, and we distribute uh, to those campuses and they also distribute back to us as well. And we're doubling our capacity every 12 months in this space. Um, and that's important so that we get global expertise into our classroom as well, particularly uh, with the rate of change uh, that things are, are happening uh, across the world. Um, we're also making sure that our students have got data in their hands, that they uh, have mobile access. We have ELSI, which supports the students 24 seven. Uh, it drives efficiencies and increases our engagement with our students. Uh, and more and more students are using handheld devices for a variety of uh, engagement experiences, whether that's watching their eye lecture or, or whether that's uh, checking on their marks or interacting uh, with their tutor or social connectedness uh, with each other as well. Um, and we're working in the analytics space uh, quite strongly as well. So we have a student discovery uh, model that we developed uh, a few years ago. Uh, we first collected data in about 2010-11 and we've put in all the student data from a variety of, of systems. You can see half a dozen uh, listed there and it goes into a discovery model and we can ask uh, our data analysts questions of that data and, and they will uh, produce the analytics around that. Particularly useful insights about how different cohorts are performing, uh, whether students coming in from particular pathways are performing well, uh, whether mature age students are doing better than school leavers, etc. There's a variety of uh, questions that can be used, but this has millions and millions of uh, data points and uh, is used by a small team of um, data analysts and, and learning analytics uh, specialists who work with us in, in that space. Uh, we also, of course, use uh, Blackboard Learn and uh, use this quite extensively, making sure it's in the hands, of course, of every academic and that we've upskilled them to use the data. And again, our small analytics team works uh, with the data and creates insights for our uh, directors of student engagement so that at the grassroots they can target uh, initiatives at students who are at risk or who we're predicting uh, will need some extra support 
so that analytics is part of everyday life um, and I'm sure it's the same in many of your organisations as well. So we have our integrated uh, reports. Uh, we get the nightly updates. Um, it really does enable the faculties to target their strategies uh, where it's important and I think uh, with the government policy changes around retention and around graduate employability, equity and, and student satisfaction, the use of data to drive uh, performance in that way will become ever more critical. Um, I guess important for us to talk a little bit about how we think AI will change the world that we're, we're in. And certainly it's predicted that uh, the AI landscape uh, will change. Um, from the conference in China earlier in the year, uh, very much that AI and machines will be part of the teacher's role, that uh, the most challenging thing perhaps for all of us will be to work out how do we actually uh, work in a team with a robot and with artificial intelligence at the table. Uh, and that's a reality and in some countries, uh, China in particular, they're already starting to roll out uh, technology in the classroom where you see the student and the teacher machine needing to have a relationship. Uh, Task-driven, multidisciplinary learning and the creation, as I said, of new spaces when the physical world meets the virtual world as well. So technologies uh, will deeply transform uh, our current teaching methods. And I think while we've always said, and, and some of the data suggests that teachers will always be needed, and they certainly will be. Um, I think uh, it's, it's going to change. There's no doubt uh, about that. Uh, and if you look at uh, learning generally, um, the landscape uh, of knowledge uh, will change. Uh, the present, presenting to learners is going to be different. We'll have more data and more information about the learner so that we can sequence uh, uh, our, our teaching to meet the learners' needs, and AI is really going to assist us to improve uh, learning. So how can we make sure we equip our students uh, with the workforce for the workforce of the future? Uh, a few things I think uh, that we're working on and I'm sure is going to uh, be assisted by AI as we go forward. Looking at stackable credentials and a framework for lifelong learning. And over time, I would expect that our student systems would be informed by AI so that as students take our nano credentials or our micro credentials, they, they'll be informed of, of what to study next. Uh, we've got an approach in place where we've put assessment either into each nano that we're delivering. A nano would be a one day masterclass or in fact that you would do a few masterclasses and assessment would draw it all, all together. But again, we're going to need systems in place and AI that will help the, the learner navigate through what, what would be good for them to learn next or how would they bundle uh, their learning together. Uh, so we're looking to the future to develop personalised degrees where you might have 100 credit point stacks around a particular theme uh, and develop uh, personalised degrees in that space rather than the way we currently develop curriculum from 101 to 301 and a student takes every unit that we uh, designate across the course. Uh, so we're working in this space and in fact all of these stacks up here are something our faculties have already uh, started working on so that across the university we've got interdisciplinary learning opportunities uh, whether that's in something like innovation and entrepreneurship or thriving organisation or sustainable futures and you can, in essence, pick and mix these stacks and put that together with a research stack uh, for that personalised uh, experience. We're also working uh, with our uh, global challenge platform, our game-based platform. Again, a lot of analytics and metrics are built into this. And the goal here is around personalised learning and making sure that we can see the decisions that the learner's making as they go through the program that we have the analytics, that we can guide their learning, uh, and importantly, that we can assess uh, what the learner is doing and what they're learning. Uh, so we've got this in our capstone units uh, across uh, a few courses in the university, and we've also been working uh, with the vet sector as well. 
And what this slide shows uh, is um, that uh, while the class is on at two o'clock, uh, the students are engaging uh, with the material all the way through uh, the day until they get to class as well. So a very engaging uh, way of learning uh, using this sort of a platform and then our analytics uh, that shows uh, how the learners have learned. So with that, thank you very much for your time and thanks for listening.